BET is the global meeting place for the education community. A trusted brand with more than 30 years of heritage, the BET series promotes the discovery of knowledge and technology to enhance lifelong learning. This episode of the EdTech Podcast is sponsored by Pearson, the world's learning company. In a world of increasing change and technological advancement, the need for people to have transferable skills is more important than ever. Aligned to the future of skills and employability, Pearson BTech prepares learners for the future world of work by providing them the knowledge, technical and transferable skills they need to be successful in their careers and in their lives. For more information about BTech qualifications, visit btechworks.com. As an educationist, if you're not an optimist, there's something seriously wrong. You know, you've got to, you know, we've got to try and hopefully create a better world for the next generation. Um, I had a teacher um, and she was talking about health and social care and how that links very closely to um, nursing. And I thought, um, why not? I'll give it a try. Earning and working, you know, it, you know it's, it, it's real for many people. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the EdTech Podcast. How are you all doing out there? I wonder where you're listening in and what your weeks have been like and how you're coping generally. But hopefully you're all good and great to have you listening in again. Did you know that according to Spotify, the number of listens to education podcasts grew by 20% in the four weeks between March and April? We can certainly believe that. So a welcome to all of our listeners, new and old, and I hope you're doing okay out there. And we're very grateful to have you listening in. This week, we're back with our What Matters in EdTech series, season two, this time looking at skills. Let's think about key workers for a second. Did you know that due to a leap in online sales in 2020, Amazon has added 175,000 temporary positions since March and plans to add more than 133,000 employees to its ranks over the next several months, whilst delivery company Hermes created 10,500 jobs in the UK alone. And in the year to April 2020, the number of nurses in the NHS in England increased by 13,500 whilst UCAS statistics revealed a 16% rise in applicants for nursing and midwifery courses. Meanwhile, the Office for National Statistics also reported that nearly 700,000 jobs have vanished off UK payroll since the start of the pandemic. That is all a very statistical way of saying there is huge change in employment and skills development. Which skills are in demand and how are people reskilling? How did key workers in the pandemic train for this moment and how can adaptability and resilience be developed from an early age to deal with such crises as these? And what changes in assessment and qualifications and support will we see in reaction to our new societal needs? In this episode we look at all this and more, plus as always some great book recommendations and the usual anecdotes, allegories and insights. A big shout out to Bet for supporting this series and Pearson for supporting this episode and to our fantastic guests this week who end the episode on an optimistic and inspiring note. To start, let's listen in to this amazing 19-year-old key worker on her experience of 2020. So my name is Naomi Dardai. I'm a healthcare assistant at Norfolk and Norwich Hospital um, and I've been there since March, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Wow. And how has 2020 been for you? Oh, it's um, it's been a roller coaster. Um, firstly, with college ending um, very suddenly, we had to do everything online. And then I started my new job right at the same time. So everything was kind of um, confusing at first. And then with this whole um, pandemic, we started getting patients at the hospital and then I was very new, so I was still getting used to everything. Um, But I was very lucky because we were studying pandemics and epidemics right then. Yes, so um, our course was, was then based not on the Ebola pandemic, but then on the COVID pandemic. And we were researching everything, um, keeping up to date with the whole virus. So then we had all this information, which then prepared me for my job. Because then when I went into work, I knew what was happening. I knew the procedures. I knew what to do. So it gave me a little bit of uh, reassurance that I I knew what I was doing. 
Wow, that's really interesting. And so whose decision was it to switch uh, from studying about Ebola to uh, coronavirus? Um, our public health teacher, she was kind of following it from the start when when it started in Wuhan in China. She was telling us about it like, oh, you know, speaking of pandemics, look what happened. And then we were kind of um, following it since then. And then when it became more global, that's when we decided that we should uh, do our research on it. And if I understand correctly, your studies were a BTEC in health and so care, which you took at City College in Norwich. So I just wondered, when did you start that course? And is that now finished? Is, was that sort of finished before you started your, your work at the university hospital? Or were you kind of doing the two side by side? Um, so I started it in 2018. Um, I was still doing my course while I was I started my job. Um, so I was doing my training for my job it was during the school holidays. And then I came back to college and then I was doing my college work. And then when I would have um, days off, I would work at the hospital. Wow. What, what kind of took you down the BTEC route in order to go into nursing? Um, well, I did do one year of A-levels before I did my BTEC, um, and I've always wanted to be a nurse, and I knew that I had to get into it somehow, but I didn't want to necessarily go through the uni route, um, so when I was moving on to my second year of A-levels, um, I had a teacher who then became one of my main teachers during the course. Um, and she was talking about health and social care and how that links very closely to um, nursing. And I thought, um, why not? I'll give it a try. And then when I started doing my course, I then saw how closely it relates to um, what I want to do and how realistic it is. And we were learning about laws and procedures and policies and stuff that was very relevant to what I wanted to do. So for me, that was just a big bonus. That's fantastic. And what was it about the university side of things that you thought, oh, I, I, I don't fancy that as much? Well, I'm the type of learner that I, I like to learn practically. Um, um, so uni for me is very theoretical. And you do go on placement, but I want to feel comfortable where I'm progressing into an answer for example I'm a healthcare assistant at the moment so I'm getting very hands-on experience mm. and I've been doing bank work which means they send me where they need in the um, hospital but I've just been contracted to the cardiology ward and I want to continue doing an apprenticeship which is a TNA apprenticeship training nursing associate which I can progress from healthcare assistant to training nursing associate which is on the job kind of um, work and for me that that um, helps me more to become a more confident nurse if that makes sense um, because I've already got that experience that I wouldn't have had if I just went straight to uni. Yeah no it absolutely makes sense um, and I was thinking about this I was thinking sort of how, how old are you as we speak? I'm 19. 19 um yeah, I mean, I was thinking sort of every new generation that comes up sort of wants to have a positive impact on the world. And in a way, uh, perhaps having sort of that hands-on, um, well, going the BTEC route, perhaps as a quicker way to make an immediate effect for sort of people that are passionate about, you know, making a positive impact. What do you think about that idea? Yeah, definitely. And with BTEC, they um during the course they send you on work experience so in my first year I was in a uh, daycare center for people with dementia and at first I was really scared because I was like oh no if people with dementia I'm not sure I've, I've never worked with anyone I've never had anyone in my life so I wasn't sure how to approach it but then um, doing the work experience there slowly I've built my confidence up and then I saw how how much like healthcare workers are needed and how big of an impact they make on someone's life even though um they do have dementia um you can make them smile and that would make their day and um I feel like if you do want to make an impact especially in the healthcare world um BTEC is definitely the way to go um because then 
in my next year, I did um, my work experience in a nursery. So it's completely different. Mm -hmm. And that's why I like they throw you in different areas. So then you get used to it. Yeah, um, yeah. And again, it was just really, it was, it was a really good experience. That's really heartwarming to hear. Um, and I was looking up earlier some statistics around uh, the re recruitment in nursing. And it said, uh, mm. in the year to April 2020, the number of nurses in the NHS in England increased by 13,502. So, uh, yeah, definitely mm -hmm. demand for more nurses. Yeah. And what's been the most difficult part of, you know, your training? And perhaps if we look at 2020... Uh, the most difficult and the most sort of heartwarming uh, part of it? I think um, it was when um, it was the first peak of COVID and um, everything shut down and then I was just going to work. I was sent to the COVID wards quite a bit because they needed staff on there. Um, and just looking at the patients who they didn't know what was going on. We didn't know what was going on. And you kind of want to help them, to reassure them, but you can't because you we couldn't then because we didn't know much about the virus and it was also new and they were kind of looking to us like am I going to be okay and we're like well we don't know and that was for me the hardest part because I wanted to give an answer like yeah yeah you'll be fine don't worry but you just didn't know back then mm -hmm. yeah it's 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 um really easy to forget like how different it was even in sort of March yeah. April so yeah, I can imagine how hard that must have been. And and how about, you know, the sort of positive things that will stick with you? Um, I think this whole experience really did make everyone work closer together as a team um, because then we needed to rely on each other when going in a patient's room, but then going outside and being with other staff, we had to be safe. You mentioned in the beginning, so obviously Corona is coming along and it's a new virus and there's a sort of massive learning curve that must come with that, especially if you're a key worker. Can you kind of relate to the idea of, um, you know, having to suddenly take on a completely new set of skills and learning to uh, deal with that situation? Oh, yeah, 100%. Because um, when I did my training, this was a few weeks before um, we had COVID in the hospital and we were just trained the general things. But then when COVID came into the hospital, we had to change almost everything, um, the procedures, the way we approach patients and everything. Um, right at the beginning, we didn't have much, but then we started developing. Um, I think the hospital then came out with e-learnings. So it has to be safe um, with COVID patients and then, um, everything surrounding COVID, what it is and how to handle it for the time being. And then we also had um, some training. Um, I remember at one point we thought we were going to have, um, I think, over 300 patients. I think we were planning to have all the patients that were COVID positive in the in Norfolk coming to our hospital. So we were preparing for that. And then they were training us on critical care and um like kind of for the worst case scenarios um if we had a, a lot of patients and uh, we needed ventilators so that we would know what to do even we, if we were just healthcare assistants and it was mostly aimed at nurses they really wanted us to know what was going on and what to do in case mm -hmm. um it was going to be a really big like wave so that was really good. That was really like helpful to prepare us. It's amazing. That's a huge responsibility to yeah. have at 19, let alone any age. So, um, yeah, just I wanted to also say a personal thank you to you for for uh, doing your training and getting stuck in and, um, you know, taking it all in your stride. That's an amazing thing to have done. Oh, thank you. <laughs> OK, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Take care. You ba too. Bye bye. Bye bye. In our chat, Naomi talks about the experience of hands-on practical learning as part of her health and social care vocational qualification. To understand more about how vocational learning pathways are adapting to the changing employment landscape, I caught up with Cindy Rampersword from Pearson. The last time we chatted was at BET in January 2020, just months ago in one way, but in another way, a long, long time ago. Hi! 
Hi, Cindy. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? It's been a long time. Well, um, I'm delighted to have uh, Cindy on the line. And Cindy, last time we met was at BET in January of this extraordinarily long year. So um, how have you been doing since January? And uh, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to talking to you about skills today. Well, lovely to be talking to you again, Sophie, after such a long time and and you're right so much has happened um in in nine months and I think when we met um we were talking about skills and the future of skills and how you know industries were pivoting what's happening with digital um and I would say over the last nine months um with COVID um a great deal has happened a great deal has accelerated um And certainly, I guess our priority this year and my priority this year has been to make sure that we support schools and colleges, the training providers, the employers that we work with to really help um, learners progress in this unprecedented, the most overused word in the dictionary um, this year, but really helping them to progress and create some sort of certainty in a really uncertain environment. So our real focus was the delivery of the exams in the summer. Um, to uh, you know, almost half a million learners doing um, BTEC. Well, let's come on to that. But but before we do that, um, for anyone that wasn't able to listen into that January episode, can you sort of uh, give a little introduction as to you know who you are and uh, what you do in your role as well? Absolutely. Um, so I'm Cindy Rampersord. I'm a senior vice president at Pearson. Um, And I have responsibility for um, heading up the business unit that looks after technical and vocational education. So that is everything from apprenticeships, BTEC, T-levels, functional and life skills. Um, And we support probably about a million learners a year. Um, The age range is from 14 all the way up to probably 80, 90, who knows. Um, We operate in the UK, but also in about 70 markets around the world. Um, And we work with schools, colleges, training providers, um, employers, and increasingly with learners directly um, and as as consumers of learning and and adults in particular. Um, I'd say core to what we do is about the provision of learning and access to learning um, and really that learning helping people and young people and adults to progress in their lives. So it might be further education, it might be higher education, it might be an apprenticeship, but in the context of this discussion today, it's also about how do we support adults with learning that supports them to progress in their careers, but also in life in general. Um, so it's a it's a broad spectrum, but at the heart, it's vocational education. Um, so I've got here this year. There's been a great focus on the role played by key workers in the pandemic and huge shifts in the employment landscape, with both massive recruitment drives, for example, by online retailers like Amazon. But at the same time, record unemployment, for example, in hospitality or other sectors. Um, From your perspective, what industries do you see will be forecast to grow? What job roles will be created and what skills will be needed in the rest of 2020, 2021? So the first thing I I wanted to say uh, on this point is that one of the things that the pandemic did was it really shone the spotlight on vocational education and, and all of those learners who go down that pathway. Um, and we should be celebrating them and obviously huge thanks for everything that they've done. So in supporting communities, but also the broader economy. So, you know, all the healthcare professionals, public service professionals, people working in food and distribution. I think what the pandemic has done, it's accelerated some trends But I think it's also pivoted growth in some new sectors. um, And obviously, there's been some decline in others. And before the the pandemic, we knew that we were going to have significant gaps in particular sectors. So social care, for example, I think the projection is that we'll need a million more people employed in that sector by 2025. The NHS, the DfE skills um, uh, survey came out just last week and talked about the gap in the NHS. And I think Um, projections are there'll be a quarter of a million additional people needed in that sector by 2030. Uh, There's also a real focus on infrastructure, so engineering, construction, just the the kind of built environment around us. Um, And I think the projections from uh, the engineering bodies is that as an economy, we need 200,000 more people working in engineering um, going forward a year. So those were all in existence, but actually 
I think some things have been accelerated. So, and you touched on this. So digital in particular and the role of digital in retail, in education and learning, in distribution and, and logistics and in business services. I think all of that um, has really accelerated as a result of the, um, the pandemic. And, and I don't think we'll shift back. So we'll see that change continue. And then we've had some real focus on emerging industries. Um, so the environment, sustainability, wellness and agritech, interestingly enough, because one of the things that we're seeing globally around the world is a trend to more self-sufficiency mm. and, and insourcing. And, and as we see that, um, I think this whole idea of looking at skills that are really honed into and tuned into um, food and agritech and sustainability and the environment will will increase both you know in the UK but also um, more globally so I think COVID has um, you know, it's accelerated some stuff it's shone a light on on some new areas and obviously in the short term some industries have gone through quite a significant decline so um, travel and hospitality um, and the tourism industry um, as well, all of which I think will, will bounce back in some shape or form, you know, probably 18, 18 months out, who knows. I mean, one of the things I wanted to say about skills is that um, skills and upskilling is as relevant for young people as it is for adults. So for young people, it's about entering the job market. For adults, it's about remaining relevant. Um, and I talked earlier about, I think on technology, actually, interestingly enough, um, there was a really fascinating article published by the CBI and McKinsey um, before we went into lockdown. Um, and they talked about um, nine in 10 workers will need to reskill in the future. Um, and some of that reskilling is light touch. It's on the job. Um, but some of it is more formal. Um, but it is a staggering, I think it's about 26 million people, which I found quite staggering, but I'm sure it's well researched. It's this CBI and McKinsey. But I guess what that says is that for people to remain economically viable and for us to be, you know, have social mobility in our in our economy, the need to upskill and think about how you move as your industry moves or move across industries as your industry declines or move into new industries would be crucial and actually creating those pathways and access to learning for young people and adults becomes even more crucial. And the skills, I think, that are proving to be really, really important are ones that, you know, the Future of Skills report talked about. But I think the ones that I would pick out are um, transferable skills and adaptability. Um, and the core skills are obviously around digital, around curiosity around creativity but also around networking and thinking about how um, individuals connect with each other but also connect with new with new industries but actually to make all of that successful I think we do need to think about what is learning and making learning relevant for different groups so schools colleges you know adults and for me, some of that is about design. Some of that is about content. Some of it is about the relevance to the world of work. Um, but it's also about accessibility. And I think digital in particular can play a really important work, work um, role. But also looking at things like module, stackable, short um, courses, and, and really just encouraging continual learning because continual learning has to be the norm. It's, we've got to create that love of lifelong learning. When you mentioned sort of modules and modularization there, um, you know, how do you think we will see qualifications and assessment develop? Do you think that micro credentials and digital portfolios of work will become sort of uh, more ubiquitous or how, how would you sort of anticipate that world evolving? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because the government is looking at um, higher technicals, which is mainly um, going to be targeted at, at obviously post 18. And one of the really important factors in apprentices is that apprenticeships are another key area. You know, one of the key considerations for many adults is how do they combine keeping up to date, um, reskilling, learning with actually working, earning and working, you know, a term that's used frequently in FE, but, it, you know, it's, it, it's real for many people. And I think the only way 
we can do that successfully, especially if it's continual learning that we're, we're talking about and continual upskilling, is we have to make it accessible. And so digital definitely is the way. But I also think, you know, sometimes it might be bite-sized in its own right. So I talked about earlier that, you know, if it is that staggering number that McKinsey talked about, nine in 10, some of it might be quite light touch. So it might just be a piece of bite-sized content with a, with a digital credential. Um, some of it might be far more technical. So going from healthcare to life science, in which case it might be modular and stackable. Um, and, and, you know, having a digital record of that, as well as some blended learning, who knows? I don't, I don't think it's linear, but I think, I think it's about greater flexibility and relevance of content and digital being a key enabler. And, I, I, you know, we, we all talk about um, young people and how they learn and how they interact with tech. And it is part of their, their everyday lives. And actually, for many of us as adults, it's also what we use to, to get up to speed. People have Kindles or you might read an article. So we're, we're all constantly learning. So I think we need to also think about how we formalise some of that to really support both young people and adults bit of a far-fetched analogy here but I was thinking about the Olympics and I was thinking about uh you know uh, every time they have the Olympics they they have to make the decision on dropping some sports uh and adding new sports in so they they might drop I don't know curling and put in solo synchronized swimming or something like this <laughs> and 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 it, and and a far-fetched analogy it was making me think of qualifications and I just wondered uh you know in your world, how do you go about sort of deciding which qualifications um, perhaps should be developed and introduced and when is the right time to sort of let others go? How does that work? So I think in the, I mean, first of all, I, I think in terms of, you know, primary, secondary, um, all of that area, I think polls have a, a really important role to play um, in terms of um, assessing progress, assessing standards. Um, and I think I've, I've said this before um, in other talks that I've done where, you know, the, the the importance of the foundations of English and maths and digital skills needs to be across the board from, from, from early years, you know, numeracy, literacy, digital skills. But I also think we, you know, if I look at school curriculum, increasingly the need to think about how we design curriculum and we embed some of those future skills so the ones that um I talked about earlier so you know the creativity the adaptability empathy um teamwork critical thinking um so it's more that's more about the design um I think when it comes to vocational education I think we we need to make sure that um you know the content is is relevant to the real world. And I think, so we've developed um, a portfolio, as you know, um, around esports. Um, and there are people working in that industry doing everything from, you know, their competitors, but they're also planning the events, they're doing the marketing, they're doing the coding, they're you know, fast arrays, whole industry. Now, if we don't um, adapt and respond to that, we're not helping people, we're not, we're not, we're not thinking about the talent of the future. So I, I think it is about looking at trends um, and responding to trends. And a really good one would be environment and, and renewables, where we know there'll be the current generation are concerned about values and the environment and, you know, looking at green and, and renewables and sustainability. There will be roles in that area. Um, and it's about how we look to develop um, curriculum that's relevant that supports access to those careers so I think um, I think it's not necessarily always about stopping but obviously some things do stop so you think about how we did printing in the past it doesn't exist so doing a course on how we did printing in the past would be of no use to anybody but it, it's looking at the emerging industries it's looking at the growth industries but but more than that I think it's going back to the point I made earlier it's about it's about those core skills of adaptability and transferability. And then finally, I've got here, who are you influenced by around the issues of skills development? So any people, projects or books or things that you go back to to kind of uh, keep that energy going in, in what has been a, a quite a full on year? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I, I normally go back to... Um, 
because I, I came from the, the music and film industry, as you know, before I came into education. And I often go back to some of the lessons there of, of you know, how skills changed and how those sectors changed and who were the survivors, who weren't the survivors. Um, I, I'm really fascinated by businesses like Ocado who um, have able, have, you know, have really moved into that digital retail space, um, have developed partnerships and, and have stayed really true to what consumers need and want and are really tuned into them. And I think in some ways, it's the same with learners, understanding how it's shifting and what the need is and, and supporting it. Um, and probably books. I mean, I read like Harvard Business Review and, and you know, The Economist and all that kind of stuff. I love reading all of that, as well as amazing books like um, my favourite book that I've read this year. I'll, t- I'll share two, which is nothing to do with the business world, but um, Girl, Woman, Other, which is amazing. And the second book is I Know Why the Crawl Dad, um, Crawl Dads um, Sings, which I think... Um, sings or cries people should read both of those books um, but if I had to pick one management or leadership book um, my favorite is um, Our Iceberg is Melting um, by John Cotter um, and I think for me this book is it kind of talks about uh, human behavior um, you know we're all we all behave a certain way in the environment of change and it's how we encourage each other to look at the change um, full on and, and really position ourselves to to succeed. So I think, um, you know, the, the iceberg was melting and some people were in denial. And I guess sometimes when I think about skills and I think about careers, I mean, your point about which industries are, start, are starting up and which ones aren't, it, mm. it's about, you know, it's about having the insights, it's about having the data, it's about being brave, and it's about really thinking about how we position all of this um, in the best interests of learners for the future. Much of this skills development has to start early. It's not academia or skills, knowledge or skills. It can be both, and it's often woven through all of our experiences. One person passionate about getting to work on skills from the get-go is Mark Steed from Kellett School, recently recognised as the British International School of the Year for their work on supporting educators during the pandemic. Here we chat about how he would like to see the education sector move forward and more quickly on cultivating essential skills. And a timely reminder that educationalists are in the future business. I'm the principal and CEO at Kellett School, which is the British International School in Hong Kong. We've got two prep schools running three aged uh, 4 to 11 and the senior school running 11 to 18. Following British curriculum, we do GCSEs and A-levels. Um, we're a pretty academic school. You know, we've got some of the best A-level results of any British international school in the world. Got a very strong tradition around well-being within the school. Uh, it's a really interesting place to work. And obviously, Hong Kong's been through quite an interesting time over the last year or so. It's been a very interesting journey to, to be running it. And what brought you to the school? What were you doing uh, prior to that? So previously I ran Jess Dubai, which is one of the leading not-for-profit schools in the Middle East. And then before that I ran the Berkhamsted Schools Group, which is a group of independent schools in around Berkhamsted in Hertfordshire. And before that ran Kelly College, now Mount Kelly in, in Devon. So it's my 20th year as a school leader, which is a little bit worrying. This episode is all about skills. You've talked passionately about skills for many years, including a great support for micro-credentialing, if I understand correctly. So I just wondered if you could share a little bit with our listeners about your philosophy around skills and also how you weave that into what you do for your learners on a sort of day-to-day basis. I think one of the things that's really worrying about education at the moment is that there's this huge dislocation from a sort of 20th century education system, in part 19th century examination system, and what young people really need to live and thrive in, in the mid-21st century. So I, I think the the British exam system, GCSEs, A-levels and degrees, is, is, is no longer sort of fit for purpose in terms of being a proxy for employability. Just because you've got GCSEs, A-levels and a degree doesn't actually mean that you've got any of the skills that people need in the workplace. What I've tried to do in various ways in schools over the past 
decade, I suppose, is to, to put in place the wider curriculum, particularly skills-based curriculum that supports the sort of workplace skills that young people need to develop. So at Jess and and here at Kellett, you know, we're we're putting innovation on the curriculum as a subject um, in year seven and eight, which is going to be based around problem solving in various contexts. Some of it's going to involve sort of coding type problems. Some of them will involve design thinking type problems. Some of them will, will involve trying to come up with solutions to some of the big problems that the world faces. And young people work in teams. So one, one of the projects is to build a robotic arm. And because the way the groups work, they, you know, they won't actually get to the end of building a robotic arm in the time available. And the next group has to actually pick up the previous group's robotic arm and try and finish it off. And that's how life is. And, you know, so often in school, we just start with a blank piece of paper and teach people to get as far as they can. Whereas in life, we, we're we always taking over someone else's job or someone else's project. You know, it's, a, it's a very rare thing to start a project, see it through from start to finish. So it's those sorts of life skills of team building, problem solving, and collaboration and creativity that I think we need to build into to how we do things. And then alongside that, we need a whole set of digital skills and in the whole mindset that is adaptable and and the whole toolkit of how to get through life in terms of one's well-being. So I think those wider skills you know, are, are really important. I absolutely love that. I love the the idea of you know, passing on the project and actually the challenges that come with that. So taking on someone else's work and having to work around any problems that come up as a result. And there's a couple of things there. So I was thinking about our recording this morning and I, I was sort of, I did politics A-level and it started making me think back to that and learning about sort of a written constitution versus an unwritten constitution and the the kind of differences between them. And it got me thinking about curriculums and whether there's a way to make that more flexible and suppose taking some of the arguments for a, an unwritten constitution. So there's a bit of a, a, a slightly strange kind of parallel, but I just, I wondered what your thoughts were on, on curriculum and how that relates to skills and how we might move forward from the description of education that, that you gave in the beginning and that being slightly out of date as well. Yeah, I think it's spot on. So much about the British curriculum is is focused on assessment and and so whether they know and some of that's tied to qualifications that relate to children like GCSEs, A levels, and degrees. And some of it is just assessment that's assessing the school, whether it's SATs or, or whatever. And I think when you when you take those things out of the equation you end up with a very different look at what education might be like. Mm. I mean, in, in our adult lives, we we might study for another degree, but we know most of the time we just do lots of bits of training in the workplace. And we might do, you know, we might do a course here, we might do, you know, a sort of micro qualification there. And we build up a portfolio of experiences and of qualifications that we've you know some micro qualifications that we've done if you think about how qualifications work in you know in, in the adult world well i mean basic question why it can't work like that in schools as well so i think you know in 20 years time i think we will be in a situation where we don't have gcse's and a levels as qualifications i think we we will have some sort of portfolio a lot of that will be digital, but we will we will have a, a portfolio of, of micro qualifications of courses we've studied, of experiences that we've had. And at the moment, we've obviously got a very heavily examined system, of, you know, sort of 10 subjects at GCSE and three at A-levels type thing. So I think what will happen in the transitional period is we will probably get back to a core of sort of perhaps maths, English and science. Mm. And that the other subjects, you know, the creatives, the histories, the, you know, the, the, the humanity, other humanities and so on, will be all picked up with this digital portfolio or wider portfolio. 
Yeah, at the moment, there's too many political pressures from government. No government wants to be the one that got rid of Ailem. But in practice, somebody's going to have to do that. And, and COVID actually is probably one, one of the accelerators of change around that. It's one of the areas where the fact that we didn't have exams last year and the, you know, the sky didn't fall in is, is probably a good thing. And we can move a bit closer to a different model of how we progress students and work out which university they're going to is the right fit for them and what's the right course. I was going to ask you actually how was it in Hong Kong with regards to examinations did those go ahead or were they online or did was it worked out in a different way? Well we set a combination of GCSEs and IGCSEs but they're all governed by the exam boards in the UK so what actually happened was that we we actually were back in school for the period of the you know, exams, but our students, like the students in the UK, didn't have to sit them and got grades on the basis of centre assessed grades. So our students were treated in the same way as UK students, but that may well be a different case again this year. I think, you know, I think there are international exams. See, we still have AS levels in the international school community, which people no longer have in the UK. So people are sitting those, and we have exam sittings. We've got a November and a January exam sitting because the international community needs that. So I think it, it may be slightly different this year for us. And I'm really curious because I was, I was interested in the idea that the school was closed, then reopened, then closed, and, and now is back open. And have you had to adapt, for example, with some of the problem solving and project based learning tasks that you were doing with your students so the robotic arm and things like that how have you managed to keep that ethos behind developing skills going during these challenging times as everyone likes to call them well i, I think it, you know, it's really difficult because those sorts of collaborative tasks and, and so on you know i mean you, one can collaborate online there's a limit to how much you can can do the creative subjects really suffered, I think, during closure because art students need to get into an art department and engage with materials. Design technology students need to get into the workshops and use the equipment. So we're really focusing now we're back in school on trying to get as much of that sort of hands-on stuff, you know, science practicals and so on done. I think of it in traffic light terms where green is normal face-to-face teaching and and red is sort of screen-to-screen teaching and amber is mask-to-mask teaching and we're we're very you know we're 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 not back to to green yet we're in amber mode we're working in, um, in in that way at the moment and just finally Who are you influenced by around the issues of skills development? So are there any people, books that you've read or projects that you've seen that you'd love to share with our listeners as well that have influenced how you think around this? Well, I I must admit, I I read the CBI skills survey every year. Are we yet anywhere near providing what they, they do? But a much more inspirational book that I would recommend is a book called Abundance by Kotler and Diamandis. They run the Singularity University in America, which is almost like a virtual university. It's a really interesting book because what it does is it takes all of the problems that the world's got, whether it's food or water or shelter or medicine or education or energy or so on, and it takes each chapter and it shows how technology can solve all of those problems. Um, it's a hugely optimistic book, and it's it's about applying the application of technology and how these supposedly intractable problems will be solved by technology. And just to give one simple example is the, the way in which mobile phones have totally transformed rural Africa and improve the lives of people there because they are getting better value because they know which market to take their goods to to sell and where they'll get the best price. You know, it's something we'd never have dreamt of 10 years ago, you know, mobile phones transforming Africa. 
but but it, but that's exactly what's happening. And, it, and it's a, it's a, it's one of those books that probably one should read once a year just to have a sort of you know the world isn't going to ruin. You know this this is, we're not heading for a dystopian sort of scenario. We're actually heading for a better place. I love that. It's good to remind ourselves sometimes because you can get on on that track and feel like you're never coming off. But there is a different way of looking at it as well. Yeah, absolutely. As an educationist, if you're not an optimist, there's something seriously wrong. You know, you've got to, you know, we've got to try and hopefully create a better world for the next generation. As educationists, we're in the future business. That's what we're there for. We're there to create the next generation and they need inspiring and we need to to really have a vision that will will make that they they can make a better place of the world well you've absolutely inspired me mark so thank you very much for that that's that's a brilliant place to end on so thank you for your time and i hope you have a great evening in hong kong thanks very much sophie That brings us to the end of this episode and I hope you enjoyed listening in and hearing from our amazing guests. There's so much to watch in the area of skills, especially in the UK around the National Skills Fund, apprenticeships and the National Retraining Scheme. The APPG for apprenticeships is always worth a listen in. And if you consider that many of those Amazon and Hermes jobs I mentioned at the beginning are freelance or contract work only, keep your eyes on the space of worker tech, which is building up around the relatively immature freelance space to better protect and support workers. If that sounds of interest, we have two episodes coming up which you might want to tune into. The first one is around investment in worker tech and uh, the next one is on the 5th of November at 1pm UK time where we'll be live streaming a recording about skills development in the hospitality sector um, and that includes the people director of Honest Burgers. So make sure you're subscribed to the EdTech podcast to listen back or join us in real time uh, on Thursday 5th of November 1pm UK time. And we'll be live streaming that to most destinations, but uh, also Twitter and YouTube. Thanks again to Bet for supporting this series and Pearson for supporting this episode. For all the show notes, including resource and reading recommendations from our guests, it's the edtechpodcast.com. We always love to hear from you. If you don't want to leave us a voicemail, you can always tweet us using the hashtag edtechpod and bet2021. And for more content, check out the BET website where they've got tons of stuff about how to stay connected with the community and delve into subjects like this around skills. That's all for now. Do have a good week if you can. Uh, Stay safe, look after one another and goodbye.